Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. Now, over the past couple of weeks, we've been releasing episodes as part of our Books Not Bombs campaign focusing on war. And naturally, with events as they are in the Middle East and in Ukraine, we've been focusing on reactionary wars, wars that we as communists oppose. But today, we're going to change that up and talk about a war that we regard as both just and historically progressive. That's the American Civil War, or the Second American Revolution, which took place between 1861 and 1865. And to help us discuss this really fascinating and complex topic, we're really excited to have with us John Peterson, who is the executive editor for The Communist, the organ of the revolutionary communist of America. And he's joining us from New York. John, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. A specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. Communism is stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new so the first thing that I want to talk about is the fact that the American bourgeoisie today has the civil war on its mind, or rather it has the next civil war on its mind. There was an article published by the Washington Post in 2019 called In America, Talk Turns to Something Not Spoken Of for 150 Years, Civil War. And a few years after that, the New York Times ran the headline, the real path to an American civil war. You obviously have had the rise of Trump in the last couple of years. You had his near assassination just a few months ago, where not only the bourgeois press, but also Marxist.com ran headlines such as an inch away from civil war in the USA. 42% of Americans, according to a recent poll, think that a civil war is likely. So with the last civil war in mind, why is it that today the American establishment is spooked by the specter of the next civil war? Well, it's a a really wide-ranging question, actually. Um, It uh, obviously reflects a a crisis of the system, a crisis of society. The American Civil War, the Second American Revolution, as you said, really represented a, a fundamental turning point in the history of this country and ultimately the history of the world, the impact that it had worldwide uh, you know, when, when it comes to you know, U.S. the development of U.S. imperialism, the de- development of military technology, uh, and, and so on and so forth, uh, it was a, of course a very bloody event. You had you know hundreds of thousands of people killed, uh, maimed, uh, otherwise wounded. Uh, you had brothers killing each other, literally families fighting on opposite sides. It was a very divisive uh, event. Uh, and fundamentally, what it was about was about uh, you know what, what way forward for the country. Should capitalism have untrammeled access to the entire continent, or should the slave owners who had basically dominated American politics up until that time have more of a say and and be able to basically trundle along as they had done for 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 a very long time? Uh, you know, and and continue to own 4 million people and exploit them as slaves uh, in order to export cotton and enrich themselves at their expense. That that was really the fundamental question. Uh, so it was a class question, ultimately. It was a question of which section of the American ruling class, which based itself uh, on different modes of exploitation, which section should dominate politics and therefore dominate the future of the country. Uh, now, fast forward, you know, 167 years, and you have that system which was progressive at the time. Let, let's be clear. I think we can talk about this later, but this was a progressive war. This is a war that Karl Marx himself supported. He supported Lincoln's re-election uh, in, uh, in, in 1864 uh, because he saw this as a, as, as a fundamentally just war to go after slavery, to smash slavery, wipe it from the face of the earth, lay the conditions for the development of capitalism, thereby lay the conditions for the development of the working class, and then socialism, the material conditions for socialism and for a socialist revolution, and ultimately communism. That's what Marx had in mind. So it was a very progressive war at that time. But fast forward a little bit, and capitalism is still in power. It's no longer progressive. It can't develop the productive forces. It's tapped out. Uh, The only way that it can keep itself alive is through uh, massive debt, periodic crises, which the working class is forced to pay time and again. No longer are they once in a generation crises. These crises hit us every few years. And that has really rattled uh, mass consciousness in this country. And of course, it makes the uh, the ruling class very nervous as well. Now, because there is no clear 
class lead forward. There's no uh, class struggle labor leadership in this country. There's no mass labor or socialist or communist uh, uh, workers party of any kind that can give focus, a class focus to that polarization. It's been, it's been uh, you know, it's very distorted to say the least. Donald Trump, a billionaire real estate developer crook from Manhattan, has tapped into that, uh, that legitimate class anger, but given it a very distorted uh, form uh, in order to ride 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 his uh, way all the way to the presidency once before, and he may well be president yet again, depending on things how things play out in the in the next little bit here. So very they're very worried about that because the liberal bourgeoisie that basically dominates this country, the liberal bourgeoisie that grew out of uh, the the civil war, they they no longer have a way forward. Their system's at a dead end. Uh, the idea of democracy in the abstract doesn't convince people anymore. In the final analysis, most people are interested in the basics. They want jobs, they want healthcare, they want uh, good schools, they want infrastructure, they want security and safety. And this system can no longer offer that, not even in the richest, most powerful country on earth. And that's why all this talk of civil war has them has them nervous. Uh, they're, they now say that 47%, it's ticked up, the, the latest poll, 47% say that it's likely in their lifetime uh, and it's interesting, I think, that among young people, among Gen Z and millennials, it's actually 58 percent that think civil war is likely. Now, they're even more removed from the actual historical events of the civil war, but they're far closer to the crisis of capitalism, where jobs are scarce, good jobs are scarce, where buying a house is nearly impossible, where there's no political options, where there's war, uh, there's this genocidal slaughter in Gaza, there's this, you know, this drain of treasury in Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. They can see the instability that awaits them in this world. And they, unfortunately, don't yet see a class struggle way out, a clear class struggle way out, a socialist revolution that would win political and economic power for the working class, and therefore fear of people just shooting each other on the streets, all this polarization eventually boiling over into open mass violence. That that That's what's seizing the minds of a lot of people in this country right now now and that's significant you could say that the last civil war was a product of the polarization in american society through its birth pains as a major capitalist force and the polarization we see today is a product of its historic impasse and decrepitude it's interesting as well that given the scaremongering around communism and marxism in the u.s you know the country of the reds under the bed the beating heart of world imperialism, that the man that the majority of bourgeois commentators in the States would regard as one of, if not their finest president, Abraham Lincoln, enjoyed a very cordial correspondence with Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Uh, you mentioned the fact that Marx supported Lincoln's re-election, and he thought that the cause of the Union Army was progressive. I actually have the letter that was sent by the International Working Men's Association to Lincoln after he was re-elected, which says, Sir, we congratulate the American people upon your re-election by a large majority. If resistance to the slave power was the reserved watchword of your first election, the triumphant war cry of your re-election is death to slavery. And Lincoln responded courteously. He sent Marx and Engels a message back where he wrote, amongst other things, nations do not exist for themselves alone, but to promote the welfare and happiness of mankind by benevolent intercourse and example. It is in this relation that the United States regard their cause in the present conflict with slavery. So it's interesting, isn't it, that someone who the US ruling class turned into a boogeyman enjoyed such a friendly correspondence with one of their greatest presidents. But I wanted to get back to this question of the class nature of the US Civil War, because you know this was in a way, the, the first clearly and markedly capitalist war, which is part of the reason it was so brutal, it was a mechanized war. You had the clash of the ironclad battleships. You had the Gatling gun developed in 1861. You had mass engagement by troops with, uh, by the end of the war, breech-loading rifles. You had terrible casualties as a consequence. One thing that establishment historians, that pro-capitalist historians even recognize about the war is that 
there was a dynamic of the industrial north ultimately defeating the backward rural south, but they don't really get into the class character. So could you just talk about that a bit more? Sure. And, and first, just to say that, yeah, Marx was always a boogeyman, right? They turned him into a boogeyman. Uh, but Lincoln has also had his revolutionary edge taken away from him as well. Now it's just the nice words from his speeches about brotherhood and equality and all this kind of stuff. But they forget the fact that Lincoln ultimately waged a revolutionary war of mass expropriation of private property in the form of 4 million slaves uh, in order to win that that civil war. So they've, they've completely emasculated uh, him as well as far as what his real content was and what he, he actually achieved. Uh, and, and that, of course, speaks directly to the question of the class nature nature of this war, which is what they don't want to talk about. Uh, they, they, they paint it in moralistic uh, terms. Oh, it's immoral to own other humans, which of course, Marxists, you know, revolutionary communists, we would agree uh, on the basis of our revolutionary communist morality, but they, they have this abstract understanding of it. Ultimately, what they wanted was to turn those 4 million slaves into wage laborers. Ultimately, what they wanted was to free up all the land on the plantations uh, to become, uh, you know, for, to be used for commercial agriculture uh, in a different way on the basis of uh, yeoman farmers and so on. They had this, you know, very confused vision exactly what they wanted, but what they knew for sure was that they wanted to, to dominate the federal government, the union, uh, the North wanted to dominate the federal government so that they, they could invest in railroads, they could invest in canals, uh, they could invest in, uh, in other kinds of infrastructure that would allow them to further develop uh, industry in this country. They wanted to uh, expand westward without the impediment of slavery. They wanted mass industry, mass agriculture. Uh, they really wanted to, to harness all the potential of this, this huge continent uh, that, that they had basically inherited after the first revolution. And so uh, th those were the fundamental class interests. For a long time, power had been shared between the slaveocracy in the South, which had different origins, but ultimately came together as a bloc to defend their interests against the rising industrialism of the North. Now, it wasn't, uh, it, you know, like all things, it was very complex. It was, wasn't was black and white. Uh, not everyone in the North was, uh, was anti-slavery. Not everyone in the South was pro-slavery. But broadly speaking, those are the lines that were drawn over time. And eventually, there were no more compromises possible. The the North, the capitalists, they wanted to assert their dominance. They wanted to assert the, uh, you know, they wanted political power commensurate with their economic power, which was going to grow even uh, greater over the next period. And the South wanted to basically keep things the way they were. And eventually, that came to a breaking point. And the South then decided that they would just leave the Union. They, they, they claimed that they had voluntarily formed this union. Uh, and, and to be fair to them, the U.S. Constitution, as adopted after the first revolution, did allow for slavery, did protect slavery. Uh, and they, they actually saw the North as breaking with the Constitution because they no longer wanted to follow uh, the guidance of that document on, on the question of slavery. Uh, so they thought that they could leave. But Lincoln, uh, of course, he said, look, we entered, we states entered this union collectively uh, voluntarily, but collectively, and we can only dissolve it collectively. And therefore, we're not going to allow individual states to veto that union that was created by by the founding fathers. So very, very, very interesting to say the least. But, it, you know, most people didn't understand all of this. I think some of the big industrialists, some of the big bankers in the North, on some gut level understood uh, exactly what the class interests were. Um, but your average pe uh, person fighting in the war probably didn't quite understand it that way. But nonetheless, as we see throughout all revolutions, throughout all historical processes, uh, the subjective understanding of events isn't always uh, a direct reflection of the real objective uh, process is taking place. And we as Marxists always look to the fundamentals. We look to the economy above all. And that's where we can then understand, you know, the, the, the class relations, the economic relations and understand what the real essence of any event was. And that was the essence of the of the second American Revolution, the US Civil War. Yeah. And of course, these historical processes sometimes take time to crystallize and express themselves in the minds of men and women, because there was an evolution over the course of the war. And I think it's useful to talk about that in relation to Lincoln, because you're absolutely right. The way that Lincoln is presented these days, he's this great moral bastion, the great emancipator who was, I guess, inspired by, by what Christian charity to uh, free the slaves. But in actual fact, and you make this point very well in a long article that you wrote a couple of years ago now for the IDOL magazine, issue 38, we'll put a link in the description, about the US Civil War and in the podcast series you put together, which I thoroughly recommend, I'll link that as well. Um, it wasn't just a question of 
moral duty in Lincoln's mind. Lincoln began first and foremost as a unionist. He was determined to hold the union together. Uh, he didn't particularly want to um, inflame rebellion over the issue of slavery, but as the war developed, it was actually critical to the war effort that he side firmly and full-throatedly with abolitionism. Yeah, I mean, Lincoln is a really, as, as Marx says, a figure sweet generous in, in history. I mean, a really unique, uh, re really unique person. I, I personally believe that he really despised slavery. He didn't, you know, he, he was a believer in free labor, which was, mm -hmm. you know, basically the watchword of, uh, of rising capitalism at that time, at that day, a, a laborer should be able to sell their uh, their labor power for the highest wage possible. They shouldn't be tied to a particular owner, a particular employer. Uh, again, a little bit of an idealized understanding of what uh, what the relationship between wage labor and capital is. But that's essentially what he supported. And slavery, of course, is uh, is is the complete opposite of that. But he was also a very skilled lawyer. He was also a very skilled politician. He was very good at reading people and working with people and getting people, uh, getting people to work together, even as they were working against him. It really is remarkable what he was able to pull off uh, politically, starting with becoming elected president in the first place. You know, coming from a backwater, uh, you know, in in the middle of nowhere, Illinois, to become the president and to get you know the the support required on a at least the sectional scale, northern wide scale, to become the president. So anyway, that that's that's all very interesting, but. But the main thing is that he came into it first with a sort of a legalistic approach. He said, look, you know, the Constitution was agreed to collectively, like I said, therefore, you can't unilaterally dissolve it. Therefore, I am going to use my powers to defend, starting with, you know, federal property, such as Fort Sumter, uh, you know, forts that were built, military installations uh, that were built with our collective tax money, with our, you know, our, by by collective agreement by the state, are not going to be taken out of the union by by individuals, no matter what. So I'm going to use uh, what what powers I have, including the use of raising uh, military forces to put that down. Now, at first, both sides thought that it was going to be a relatively quick affair. The South, uh, a much more martial kind of a region, obviously centuries of practice, you know, holding down slave rebellions and things like that. You know, sort of an equestrian class, if you will, almost to 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 go back to the Ro the Roman uh, Republic. Uh, people literally with with horses and and gentlemen and and uh, you know practicing war, whereas the North was busy, you know, developing industry. Um, they they thought that that they could whip. The, the soft northerners very quickly. And the North thought, well, look, this is just ridiculous. We're the majority. We've got the most economy, uh, the biggest economy. We've got, you know, whatever. We're going to go smash these guys and get on with it. It didn't happen that way. Obviously, in the in the podcast series, in the article, give a little bit more detail about all the different phases. But essentially, there were two phases of the war. The first phase where, where Lincoln basically tried to get the Union back together, more or less on the old basis, trying to promise we're not going to interfere with slavery where it exists. We're not going to, uh, you know, free the slaves or anything like that. Even though Lincoln also knew that eventually, decades down the line, uh, slavery wouldn't have any oxygen on which on which to live anymore as the country continued to industrialize and develop uh, on the on the way that it was in the North. Um, but that's what he tried to do. Eventually, I think he came to understand, uh, and I think in part through the influence of some uh, prominent abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and others, understanding that um, and, you know people like Thaddeus Stevens, you know people that really understood that the economic root of the rebellion was slavery itself, and you could not uproot that if you didn't go after the root. Uh, and uh, and eventually, after the Battle of Antietam in uh, September 1862, it seemed like a good moment to sort of basically up the ante. And he announced that uh, they were going to have the Emancipation Proclamation, which basically would say that as of January 1st, 1863, just a few months later, any uh, regions, any areas still in rebellion, uh, the slaves would be considered uh, then thenceforth and forever free. So basically, he upped the ante and uh, and said that he was going to get rid of slavery. And of course, uh, this was all combined, of course, with the the emergence of of generals like Ulysses S. Grant and William Sherman, uh, Philip Sheridan, people who really understood this and and really were on board with basically blasting slavery off the continent. Now, again, not necessarily for moralistic reasons, although I think uh, Grant did also uh, despise slavery on, on a personal level, but because they understood that this was the only way to, to go after the real root of, of the economy in the South. Because remember, the South could mobilize a lot more 
uh, soldiers, fighting soldiers, because they didn't have to be farming because they had these four million slaves doing that kind of work for them. That being said, hundreds of thousands of slaves sabotaged the Southern war effort. They escaped, they emancipated themselves. They ended up joining the Union Army. Uh, you know, a, a, a good percentage of the Union Army itself was eventually made up of former slaves or, or free blacks uh, from the North who fought against slavery themselves. So it really is a dynamic thing. I mean, some people wonder why we call it a revolution. Well, not only do we have the expropriation of mass amounts of property, uh, but you have this 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 uh, this mass uprising of people in the North, in the South, in the form of the slaves, and even the, 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 the Southern people themselves, you know, it wasn't the status quo. We have all these millions of people mobilized and fighting and so on. I mean, it really was a, a really, I, I think, exhilarating, uh, incredible event in human history. And it's, it's relatively recent. I mean, some people forget that, you know, my grandfather lived to be over 100 years old. So two of his lifetimes ago, you're in, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're in, the, you know, in the 1820s. You're in the period before the Civil War. It's not that long ago. There's pictures. There's letters. There's all kinds of interesting stuff about this. There's tons of books, uh, and, and you can go visit the battlefields in this country. Uh, it, it really is quite a, quite an amazing living thing. And that I think is why this, this question of revolution being very present, revolution and rebellion. Uh, being very present in the on the minds of a lot of Americans is what scares the ruling class because the working class today is infinitely bigger than it was back then. It mm. is a hundred percent capitalist country, a hundred percent a capitalist crisis in this country, except for a tiny handful of people at the top. And they can see the powder keg that they're sitting on, and they're very worried about any inspiration coming from from uh, from these events. I think it's interesting when you had. The anniversary of the Civil War, 150th anniversary a few years ago, they hardly talked about it. Right. There were no big commemorations. There were no big parades. There was there was nothing of that. They really tamped it down uh, and 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 tried to not not remind people so much of how this was a revolutionary event in the sense that it upended the status quo. It brought the masses to their feet, and it fundamentally changed the course of U.S. and human history. It's interesting because one of the things that's difficult these days in talking about the American Civil War, sometimes you encounter this with younger people who, for understandable reasons, have a more skeptical view of their own nation's history. Usually it comes from a well-meaning anti-imperialist perspective, an anti-racist perspective, and they'll they'll almost equivocate about the Union Army and about the Confederacy. They'll say, well, obviously the Confederacy was this unique historic evil, but you still had racists on the other side. Ulysses S. Grant at one point um, owned slaves. He, he freed them, but nevertheless, as did other um, Union generals, you still had racist attitudes very prevalent amongst the North. However, over the course of the war, it's very clear that even amongst the common soldiery, certainly amongst the political and military leadership, but even amongst the common soldiery, attitudes began to change and a hardening attitude towards destroying slavery um, is, is, is very clear. You get that, for example, in looking at the songs that were sung on parade. John Brown's Body became one of the most popular marching songs of the Union Army, and that celebrates the legacy of John Brown, who was, of course, an abolitionist who led a violent rebellion and was executed uh, as a common criminal prior to the war as a result. So, you see how over the course of the war, this process, this historical economic necessity that you described began to acquire a, a bit more of a, a clear character in the minds of the people involved. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, you, you had a lot of people in the North fighting for the Union, fighting for freedom in the abstract, who were opposed to uh, having all the slaves freed because they were worried that uh, you know all these freed people would take their jobs. I mean, it was a very it was a very contradictory thing. It wasn't uh, you know just pure wonderful you know uh, anti-slavery people in the North against all these evil slave owners in the South. Most Southerners didn't own slaves at all. The vast majority of them didn't own slaves. They never have, would ever have a chance of owning slaves. Yet they were part of the structure of society where slavery was a fundamental part of it. And a lot of them just fought because the union was down where they when they're in their part of the country. I mean that 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 that's what what people uh, tend to do. Uh, they, they tend to defend their their home and hearth and so on. So um, you know, Grant he owned one slave at one point. Uh, got this person from. Uh, from, uh, from his father-in-law. But what I think is really remarkable about Grant is that at a time, at a very low point in his life, he was actually impoverished. He was selling firewood in a cart through the streets of St. Louis after he'd been discharged from the army. 
Uh, and he had gotten the slave from his father-in-law to help him build his homestead, which was called Hard Scrabble, uh, above all things. And he actually went down to the the courthouse and signed emancipation papers for for this uh, this man, uh, freeing him when at a time when he probably could have sold that person for a thousand dollars or more, which is a lot of money at that time. And instead. Instead of taking advantage of that opportunity, he he just couldn't stomach it morally, and and he emancipated uh, this person. So I think that's very different, say, from uh, Robert E. Lee, who, mm. funnily enough, most I, your average American probably is raised to believe that Robert Lee was a better general and a better gentleman than uh, than Grant, which is just blows my mind. Which again, it's part of this this uh, this process of distorting the past of 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 making these these figures as uninspiring as possible. But Robert E. Lee was a uh, was a slave owner. He separated families. He sold children down the river, literally into the deep south. Uh, he had slaves, uh, you know, viciously bitten. He even had salt water poured into the wounds. Uh, of, of of the whip marks of, of slaves that had tried to escape. I mean, so this idea that he was just this noble warrior who was defending his beloved Virginia against uh, against the evil uh, the evil Union is just nonsense. And I'm very pleased in that sense that a lot of the statues of the Robert E. Lee are finally, finally coming down. I don't have a problem with them being set up in a museum. It's part of history. He played a very interesting role. He was, a, uh, you know, in some ways a tactical uh, genius in certain battles. But the but the fact of the matter is, Ulysses S. Grant, the class that he represented, small farmers, the working class, industry, union in the North, that also affected the way that he approached the war. Uh, his strategic vision for how you could end the war by going after slavery and the economy ultimately, and not just uh, you know, and not trying to seize territory. Uh, I mean, he also wanted to smash. The, the Army of Northern Virginia, the, the, the goal was to smash the bodies of armed men that were defending uh, the Confederacy, not to occupy cities, not to destroy cities, not to kill civilians, but to smash the bodies of armed men, uproot the slave economy, uproot uh, all industry, railroads, uh, factories, and so on, uh, smash them, destroy them in order to end the root of the rebellion. And that's very different from what what uh, what Lee did, which, you know, he might have been tactical uh, here and there, had some, uh, had some moments of brilliance, but he didn't have the depth, I would say, uh, mm. that someone like Grant. And what Grant was for Lincoln was a general who was totally on board with his program. That's another problem with, with Lincoln at, at the beginning or a problem that Lincoln had to face is that most of the generals were not anti-slavery. They, they, they again, they, they saw it as a military confrontation. They thought that they just had to sort of put down the rebellion and reset everything the way things were. Grant was fully on board, not only with ending slavery in the abstract, but with bringing Black uh, troops into the Union Army. He said they will be good fighters for everyone that fights for us. It's a double blow against the enemy because now they're not going to be uh, doing doing the the grunt work in the South, maintaining the, the Confederate economy. So, uh, mm. I think that's a, an interesting aspect to, to think about as well. Yeah, I completely agree. And obviously, we don't have time to go into all the various engagements and phases of the war. If you are interested, and you should be, because it's fascinating, again, I really recommend John's podcast series, which goes into the weeds. But I do want to talk about the generals again, because you're absolutely right about Lee. He's one of the most overrated figures in history. I would say also militarily overrated, because he was a guy who loved a big dramatic charge, but was incapable, it seems to me, of maintaining a broader strategy. Um, whereas Ulysses S. Grant, he was ridiculed in the annals of history decades after the war as this drunkard, uh, an alcoholic who was incompetent and short-sighted. Lincoln famously said that if indeed it was the whiskey that characterized Ulysses S. Grant, then he wished that every general under his command had a barrel of the stuff because the guy kept winning. So clearly there was something good in that whiskey. But he had the famous anaconda strategy where he recognized that if you cut off and strangle and surround the uh, confederacy if you starve and destroy it and if you just go after as you say the armed bodies of men as hard as possible hit them as hard as possible you pragmatically use every opportunity to advance but also where you have to also retreat then ultimately the war will be won and that's what it was all about um similarly even worse actually is the treatment of william sherman because he was characterized as the butcher he was characterized as a guy who carried out horrible reprisals against civilians. He conducted himself with no honor uh, as he was attacking farmland, attacking grain stores, basically fighting to destroy the material basis of the Confederacy. But again, it's a pragmatic strategy 
dictated by what? The desire to wipe a slaver's rebellion uh, off the face of the earth. What, what's your opinion of Stonewall Jackson? I've got to ask. <laughs> well, well, first of all, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the Anaconda st strategy was developed, devised by Winfield Scott, the old uh, uh, top general at the start of the war. But it was, as you say, it was Grant who really implemented it in a, in a really decisive way with Lincoln's full support. Sherman, you know, Sherman probably was pretty racist against black people. Uh, after the war, he, you know, helped do, along with Sheridan, do some pretty horrible things against uh, indigenous populations. So people look at that. But fundamentally, in the war itself, the role that they played was exceptionally progressive, just, you know, leaving aside the violence and stuff. So now, now they go after Sherman, like you say, for his march across Georgia, uh, where they're freeing slaves, they're tearing, tearing up railroad lines and so on. Uh, but the bottom line was this was the only way, again, like I said, to uproot the rebellion. Um, Stonewall Jackson, well, it's interesting because the I would say the, the greatest tactical uh, success of Robert Lee was the Battle of Chancellorsville, where he was basically outnumbered you know, two to one, and he still divided his forces, ran circles around uh, the, the, the Union lines and completely smashed them. Uh, it was a really resounding victory in that sense, and that's that's probably where they where they a lot of people say, oh, this proves his his military genius. It's kind of an Alexander the Great type, you know, gamble that pays off, but it may not have paid off. And the reason it paid off is because the Union uh, general at that time was completely, you know, immobilized, uh, useless, not very. Uh, you know, confident at all, and therefore was easily overwhelmed and understood. And what Grant didn't do is he didn't overestimate uh, uh, Lee at all. He said, "Look, he's a he's he's a, he's a man, not a god. Uh, we're going to just get after it, and we're going to smash him." And that's what he ended up doing. Um, so, so, so Lee has this moment of brilliance, but it's precisely at that same battle at Chancellorsville where Stonewall Jackson ends up being shot by his own troops when he's coming back from a reconnaissance mission, and he loses this very important, uh, literally right-hand uh, man in his battle. I mean, Stonewall Jackson, again, a committed, a very religious, racist, uh, I mean, racist, I mean, in the, in, the, in the times. I mean, apparently he was very close to his valet, who is a slave. He, you know, he's very, very friendly and with the family. I mean, you know, it, it's a complicated society. Uh, and he, but he was, he was really driven in a, in a, in a really, um, I don't know, interesting way, psychologically way to this cause, to the cause of the South, the cause of defending Virginia. He was a, he was a trained military officer. He was a, he was in fact a, 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 a trainer of military officers in Virginia. And uh, yeah, I mean, he, he was just very bold. I mean, the, the, the way he got his name was at, at one of the first engagements uh, of the war uh, when the Confederates were being routed completely uh, in the first engagement. Uh, and it seemed like that was going to be the end of the whole war uh, right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, it, it seemed like the Union was going to win. But but Jackson, his men arrived uh, at the last minute and they set up. They set up a defensive line and they stood firm and he just stood there out in the open. Uh, and allegedly they said, look, th there stands Jackson like a stone wall, a be like him. And that kind of re-inspired re, uh, re the Confederate troops to hold the line. And therefore the unions who had lost, the Union troops who had lost all uh, discipline and all formation. They then fell apart and they get routed back all the way to Washington, uh, all the way back across the Potomac. So anyway, Stonewall Jackson's a very interesting uh, person. Uh, again, uh, John Brown, one of my personal heroes, deeply religious, deeply committed, uh, because God told him so that you have to you have to free the slaves. So, so yeah, pe people's psychology, I think, was was somewhat different back then. Uh, it might be hard for us to really get into their heads today, but 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 all of that I think is really interesting because ultimately history is made by people, not by individuals outside of the the, the broader historical context and the economy and the class relations and so on. And yet th those there are these individuals that that do play important roles and to shine light on the, the period as a whole. Yeah, and that's not something that we as Marxists deny. Uh, we think that men and women do make their own history, just not in conditions of their making, to quote Marx and Engels. I wanted to talk about something you've alluded to a number of times, which is the mythology and the falsification about the Civil War um, in the aftermath of the conflict, because a lot of these ideas we have about Robert E. Lee, for example, and also the idea that really it wasn't about slavery, it was about states' rights, it was about the right of states in the South, all parts of what's been called the lost cause myth that was popular 
in the particularly turn of the 20th century, films like Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind and the novel it's based on were also critical in sort of rehabilitating the legacy of the Confederacy and saying that actually this wasn't really about slavery. Slavery, of course, was a factor. They don't usually deny that the South wanted to maintain slavery, but they said that was a secondary point. And they also say, oh, well, actually, slavery wasn't that bad. It was kind of paternalistic. Slaves were treated a bit like family, but really that wasn't the fundamental issue. Well, there are a thousand and one reasons that this uh, lost cause myth, which comes from the idea that it was a noble cause, but ultimately there was no way the South could defeat the larger, more economically powerful industrial North. But one of the speeches from the beginning of the war, which smashes this to pieces, comes from the mouth of Confederate Vice President Alexander H. Stevens, where he lays out in black and white, um, which is an, an apt term, in March uh, 21st, 1861, the reason for what he describes as the beginning of a revolution, which is how he characterized the secession. He says, the new constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to the peculiar institution of African slavery as it exists amongst us, the proper status of the Negro in our former civilization. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution. Jefferson, in his forecast, had anticipated this as the rock upon which the old union was split, and he was right. The prevailing ideas entertained by him, and most of the leading statesmen at the time of the formulation of the old constitution, were that the enslavement of the African was in violation of the laws of nature, it was wrong in principle, socially, morally, and politically. It was an evil they knew not well how to deal with, but the general opinion of the men of that day was that somehow or other, in order of providence, the institution would be evanescent and pass away. Those ideas, however, were fundamentally wrong. They rested upon the assumption of the equality of the races. This was an error. So basically saying, yes, yes, the Constitution in the end did protect slavery, but really the Founding Fathers wanted to do away with it or think thought it would die away on its own because they thought that all men were equal and that's false and really the natural place of black people is in slavery is subordinate to white people and this is the reason maintaining slavery is the reason for the rebellion i don't think you can really put it more plainly than that no absolutely i mean well before the war started it was they, people like Stevens and others made it very clear that slavery was the issue everybody knew it everybody understood it so this idea uh, that that it had nothing to do with it is absurd. I mean, the U.S. Constitution from the beginning was was a bit of an abortion, and uh, the the so-called founding fathers kicked the can down the road on the question of slavery. They included slavery. They included the three fifths clause uh, in, uh, in the Constitution, and so on. And uh, they just kicked that down to future generations. And that's why you need to have a, a second revolution to really complete the the bourgeois revolution on this uh, in this country. Uh, but but yeah, the, the the main the only thing really the Confederates changed with their new constitution was they basically kept the old constitution but reinforced the stuff about slavery. So if it had nothing to do with slavery and was only about states' rights, that's just nonsense. The, the lost cause myth. There's an element of truth to it insofar as the industrial North was bound over time to 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 win. I mean, uh, it's interesting because Engels was really into military tactics and strategy and really followed the war blow by blow. And he could see that the Southern generals, at least at first, were, were better. Their officers were better. The cavalry was better. And he started thinking, oh, you know, maybe maybe the uh, maybe the Confederates could win this thing. And Marx, in a very interesting letter, actually had to kind of drag him back down to earth and say, hey, remember, it's about the productive forces. It's about the economy. It's about the class relations. And uh, they will eventually assert themselves. And they did eventually assert themselves. Uh, and in a lot of ways, it's a little bit like uh, like World War II, the way that the Soviet Union economy eventually overwhelmed uh, the Nazis in the sense that once the North really started to dedicate itself to this. Uh, and look, at the start of the war, New York State's economy was four times bigger than the entire uh, its industrial production, rather, not its overall economy. Southern economy was quite big on the basis of uh, of uh, cotton exports, but but its industrial base was four times bigger than the entire uh, South, just one state. So eventually, that was going to assert itself. In some ways, uh, the North fought the, the 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 war with one arm tied behind its back, even though. It, it mobilized industry and finance and and everything else in order to wage this war. So yeah, there's an element of truth that they weren't gonna they weren't gonna win, but 
what's disgusting about it is this attempt to romanticize it. It was noble. It was good. Uh, and a lot of this, you know, really built up in the 1920s, 1930s, at a time when they were legitimizing Jim Crow, when they were trying to legitimize racism in this country, uh, this idea that black people are inferior, uh, you know, that, that's just the natural order of things. And, and what a shame that the Confederacy didn't actually get the win. I mean, th there's a lot of people even to this day that they might say, well, you know, leaving aside the racism, the Confederacy was pretty great. Well, how, how do you how do you leave aside racism and slavery uh, from from the Confederacy? It, it really is baffling. And I, I would say that nowadays we have our own version of the lost cause myth starting in Ukraine, where Zelensky is starting to spin the story that, uh, you know, it was, it was a noble cause, was, but the, the Russians and they didn't get enough support from the West. Uh, in, in the case of the of the Confederacy, they were hoping that the British would come in on the side of the Confederacy, that, that just like Zelensky wants the US to, and NATO to get directly involved in war with Russia, they wanted the British to come in to break the blockade of their coastline, which is part of the Anaconda plan, uh, and, and even to send troops to, to help the Confederates fight against the Union. Of course, the British working class had, had something to say about that. Even though cutting off cotton from the South really uh, was very disruptive and very, very painful for the industrial towns, especially in Northern England and Lancashire and places like that, that where, where you have the, the a lot of the textile mills, even though the lack of cotton shut down those mills, people were unemployed. Uh, the British working class had mass meetings where they basically said to Palmerston and others in the British government, you, you are not gonna support a war uh, for enslaving people. I mean, that, that, and so I think all credit to the British working class for, for coming forward in defense of the union, essentially, uh, just as, just as Marx did uh, in the, in the, in the excerpt that you read a little bit earlier, basically understanding the essential class question of this uh, in their bones, even if they didn't understand all the nuances uh, of the economics and the politics. So uh, in the end, the British didn't support the Confederates and in the end, they, they were smashed. Uh, and it, and it, it, we're still living with the repercussions today. Because, you know, as William Faulkner, the great author, the great novelist of the South once wrote, he said that the past is never dead. It's not even past. And so we're still living with all of this uh, legacy to this day, although it's not so clear cut as it was uh, even a couple decades ago, I would say. It's, it's much more diffuse. It's much more confused. Yeah. And thanks for bringing up that example of working class internationalism at this relatively early stage having an effect in this revolution. Another thing that discussing the Civil War really brings to my mind is the hypocrisy of the bourgeois today, because the American Revolution was the last great bourgeois revolution, and it was basically how the American bourgeois, the capitalist, the ruling class today laid their stamp finally and decisively on society in the same way that you see the process begin in England and France. And today there is such scaremongering and hysteria about communism and communists as violent revolutionaries who just want to, you know, hang all the billionaires by their ankles and want to lynch the Fortune 500 and we want to create horrible bloodshed and we want to wreak terrible vengeance upon the class enemy. The American Civil War was, you've already said, it was a bloody conflict. Civil wars are always the most bloody form of warfare. They bring out all of the divisions in society and they're always fought with no quarter in the end. By the end of the war in particular, you know, Grant, and, and Sherman, Lincoln as well, they were fighting a relentless and ruthless war of destruction against the Confederacy. W mm -hmm. What do you think about these double standards? Yeah, no, I think, first of all, look, as communists, we are not for bloody revolution. We're not for violence. We're not in favor of it. I think that uh, the Third American Revolution, if the working class were mobilized, organized, conscious uh, enough, could, could be very, very peaceful, just like the early stages of the, of the Russian Revolution. If the ruling class gives up without a fight, we're the vast majority. If we decide we want to organize society differently, we should be allowed to do that. The working class should be allowed to do that. And there wouldn't have to be any violence. Uh, any violence that would uh, occur, I think, would be above all defensive because you know, we're, we're, the bourgeois does not have millions of bourgeois to put into the field uh, in, uh, in in a war against uh, the majority of the working class. I mean, that, that's just absurd. I think the working class has such potential economic power in its hands to, to shut off the internet, to shut off the power, to shut down transportation, to shut down everything just through our sheer economic power that, that I don't think it has to come to that. But it is, it is uh, extremely hypocritical for them 
to to point to us as uh, violent revolutionaries when they themselves as a class only gained ascendancy on this continent through two revolutions, both of which uh, involved elements of uh, physical violence, but above all, I would say violence against private property. Mm -hmm. The first American Revolution expropriated enormous tracts of land and property from the from the Tories, the supporters of the of the British Crown, and the American Revolution, of course, uh, one of the biggest uh, expropriations in human history, with the freeing of, uh, of of those millions of slaves, as well as you know, some of the property of, of, of the slave owners themselves. That's the part, that's the violence against private property that they're really worried about. Mm -hmm. And they tried to obfuscate that by talking about blood and violence. Because of course, of course, normal people, they want safety, they want security, they want stability for themselves, their kids, their families, and so on. Uh, so it's completely hypocritical. You see examples of this every single day in relation to Gaza, in relation to Israel, mm -hmm. in relation to Lebanon. I mean, what happened on October seventh? We're we're not we're not uh, supporting uh, the, the the killing of civilians by Hamas uh, on October seventh of last year. But what's happened ever since? Uh, I mean, it, it's beyond the pale. What's happening in Lebanon right now? They just report it as if it's just normal news. They just bombed another neighborhood. They just bombed a, a bunch of kids or whatever, as if it were nothing. Uh, and it's completely hypocritical. Uh, it, it, the bourgeois can only live on the basis of hypocrisy. But uh, I, I think it was Lincoln that actually said something like, you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. But uh, the, the bottom line is that the working class is starting to become aware that the problems in society, they're not due to this or that politician. They're not due to this or that uh, political party. They're drawing the conclusion that it's a systemic problem. And the system we're talking about is capitalism. And the only way to overcome that is through the socialist revolution, overthrow capitalist property relations, uh, seize the means of production in the name of the majority, and to operate them democratically in a harmonious way that can lead to a, an incredible quality of life for everybody on the planet. Mm. So just to bring it to a close, I wanted to develop this point that you began about the legacy of the American Civil War, which still weighs upon the minds of the American ruling class today, but also could potentially serve as an inspiration to millions upon millions of workers and youth across the U.S. The tasks that remain from that revolution, uh, the divisions that remain from that revolution, that only another revolution can resolve. What do we as communists say the next American revolution must look like and what will be its main tasks? Yeah, no, great question. I mean, uh, I think it's... Uh... It's uh, in many ways the American Civil War is the last great bourgeois revolution. I think you could argue. Uh, very shortly after that, you have the Paris Commune, where you have the first, uh, you know, workers' revolution, the beginnings of of that process that that extends then into the into the twentieth century and up until today. So, and it's also the revolution where the bourgeoisie was very, I think, quite clear, much more clear about what they were. Uh, aiming for than they were, say, in the English Revolution or even in the French Revolution, uh, a few decades or centuries before that. So, in that sense, it was, uh, it, you know, the, they accomplished as much as they could accomplish. I mean, the basic tasks of the National Democratic Revolution: uh, national unity, a unified currency, uh, you know, resolving the agricultural question. There was, you know, they got rid of. Uh, you know, well, they, they, I mean, it's complicated. They didn't completely get, I mean, they ended up with a sharecropping system, which is almost like serfdom. I mean, so it, it had mixed results, but essentially they, they end up a, a couple of decades after the Civil War with a unified country, with a unified economy and so on, obviously with some regional differences and some other contradictions, the wiping out of the, the Native Americans in the West as part of this process of industrialization and westward expansion. Um uh, but they, they end up with that. But the tasks that remain are, are tasks that can only be resolved on the basis of uh, a proletarian revolution, of a working class revolution. We're talking about things like universal jobs, healthcare, uh, getting rid of uh, the exploitative uh, wage labor and capital relationship, getting rid of capital altogether, having genuine democracy, not this bizarre farce of, uh, uh, you know, American version of bourgeois democracy that we have, uh, where we don't even uh, elect the president directly. No single American uh, voter on election day has ever voted for the president. And most people don't even know that they vote for electors because we have this thing called the electoral college. There's all these checks and balances, not 
only between the, the, the different branches of government, but above all against the majority, against the masses and in, in modern times against the working class. So the main task to be resolved by the next revolution, the third American revolution, the socialist revolution, the task would be to expropriate capitalism, to nationalize the Fortune 500, to bring the key levers of the economy under democratic workers' control, and uh, to reduce the working week, to offer healthcare education uh, for everybody, to rebuild the infrastructure that of this crumbling country. I mean, you know, it's uh, I know Britain's pretty bad, but the U.S. is getting pretty bad as well uh, in a lot of parts of the country. So, I mean, basically to to take all the wealth that humans have collectively created, and above all, the working class have created, but going on back all the way to the wealth that was created by the slaves for generations before, taking all that collective human wealth and putting it to the use of the majority to improve quality of life for everybody, not just in the US, but with those resources to also help the workers of the world uh, who have been exploited by US imperialism and devastated by imperialist wars for so long to, to also help the entire world, frankly, uh, take the, the leap to the next level. That's the level of, of socialism and ultimately towards stateless, moneyless, classless communism. All right. Thanks, John. This has been really fascinating. And we are within weeks of the US presidential elections. And I, of course, recommend thoroughly that anybody looking for a communist perspective on these events and on the aftermath, keep an eye on the Revolutionary Communist of America's website and podcast, which comes out regularly. I have to say, knocks the spots off this one as far as the production is concerned and contains really excellent analysis. You know, the, the future of the world revolution hinges on America more than anywhere else in the world because it's the most powerful imperialist country and therefore it's the absolute heart of world imperialism. There can be no world revolution without the American socialist revolution. It's why uncovering the real revolutionary legacy of that country is so important for us as communists. Absolutely. To to make a revolution, you have to understand revolutions. You have to study the revolutions of your own country. And that's what we're preparing for. Uh, we in the Revolutionary Communists of America, you can check out our analysis at communistsusa.org. Uh, we have a lot of electoral stuff uh, on there, of course, as well as a lot of other uh, interesting material. But uh, yeah, the next few weeks will be very, very interesting to say the least. And I think that the lessons that we've discussed uh, today from the, the, the first civil war, the second American revolution are going to be very relevant towards understanding what happens in the, in the next few weeks, the next few months, and the next few years as we approach that revolution uh, inexorably, because there is no way out on the basis of capitalism. The socialist revolution is the only way forward. All right. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all next week. A specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. Communism is stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I'll guarantee that ten minutes from now, a lot of you are going to have a new understanding of communism.